uh, welcome in parallel session number three about technology development. Uh, my name is Tom Pijnenburg. Um, I work at VDL Enabling Technologies Group. I'm an equipment person. I'm not really a, a, a chemical or electrochemical person per se. Uh, I'm uh, also a member of the ECCM uh, committee uh, that uh, Richard van der Zande is heading. And in that sense, I'm also involved in the exploration of the overlap between the electrochemistry and the, and the, and the high-tech equipment. Uh, on, on, the, on the photo, by the way, it's a hydrogen truck. Eh? So it's... Uh, uh, <clears throat> and for this uh, session, uh, the, the, the plan is as follows. We have two experts from industry. We have Thomas and Ivo. I will give them a very short introduction before they give an introduction themselves about, well, basically what they do and how they look at this uh, technology uh, developments uh, for, let's say, clean energy. Um, and the idea is to also have some room for discussion after the fact. Uh, I will encourage, I want to encourage you to put questions if you have them into the chat. I think it's good not to do that during the introductions uh, because maybe then it takes a long time and then the other person does not have time anymore for the introduction so i would propose that we do the introductions uh, and then uh, park questions in the chat and after that uh, look at the questions and then uh, uh, have some hopefully lively uh, discussion on that so that about it uh, this morning, uh, Mark uh, promised that I would show this picture, so <laughs> here it is. Um, and this is a result of this exploration of where this overlap is between electrochemistry uh, industry, uh, fuel cells, electrolyzers, uh, hydrogen production, uh, all of these elements, and, and the high tech, uh, which in Holland is also a, a prevalent uh, contributor to the economy. Um, and, and that's basically a sort of a schematic where on the one hand is a production going from membranes and cell assemblies to uh, electrolyzer stacks and to power electronics and balance of plant equipment and on the other hand the integration into the into the, the grid let's say and into the hydrogen uh, production uh, systems uh, and and the small text indicates themes that we have identified in the high-tech systems and materials roadmap so at first sight uh, electrochemical conversion and materials and high-tech systems and materials so the naive interpretation would be it's the materials is the overlap, but it's more than that, and that is uh, highlighted here. And uh, at the moment, we have a very uh, lively discussion in the community about this. That also Mark uh, Mark highlighted this morning. But in the interest of time and and to give space to to the to the two uh, let's say speakers, I like to uh, uh, go uh, to them and and give them a very short introduction. We'll start with uh, Thomas. Professor Dr. Thomas Thiemann from Siemens Energy. He's joining from Germany. Um, he, what I understand the background in energy technology, turbines uh, primarily uh, maybe, uh, still, still active in that community. And right now also uh, responsible to shape the Siemens Energy decarbonization portfolio. So that's a mouthful. That's a very active, I think you hold the professorship at the Bochum University, if I read well. Uh, so. Please, uh, can you uh, do the first introduction uh, from your perspective? Yeah, all correct. So th thank you very much, Ton. And let me uh, release my desktop. Hope I hope it works. So just a moment. Iron. So can you see my desktop? Yes. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, again, uh, thank you for the nice introduction, Ton. And uh, I very much appreciate the opportunity to speak here to you as a representative of an equipment supplier uh, company, uh, also uh, growing now into this new kind of field, new fields of equipment. And by the way, as you've seen, I come from energy technology. So I was a bit afraid being amongst so many electrochemical experts since this topic is so important for the future. However, it helped me a lot what you just said, Ton, and what also Mark Hendricks said in the beginning, that it, it we all will stronger grow together. And this helped me a bit um, to be uh, more positive about what might happen here in amongst all your experts. So I... I intended a bit to, to talk about more about what needs to happen to achieve the breakthrough. You all might question yourself, 
why are we not already there where we would like to be in terms of um, green hydrogen production, electrolysis, ramp up, and so on? And there, uh, we, we could collect a lot of experience in the last two, three years. And I even personally work with teams, with customers on these kind of topics and also on the governmental side. So I hope I can inspire a bit of the discussion and shed a light from this perspective on it. Um, some few short words about uh, Siemens Energy. I guess you might know Siemens Energy as a supplier. We are very active in the power generation arena. On the green power, you know Siemens Gamesa, we are, we are a big shareholder of them. But also we are very active on bringing our gas turbines to 100% hydrogen operation. We are active in transport convert and conversion of energy and also storage. And we are also very active then on the, on the uh, other end of the chain where we help to reduce the CO2 footprint and the consumption um, energy consumption in industry. So we cover the complete value chain in many areas. And for sure, we see a lot of opportunities in the future. Now, where do we come from specifically on electrolysis? I guess some of you might know uh, Siemens is heavily working on the PEM electrolysis, which is a pretty young, still industrializing electrolysis principle. So say roughly 10 years ago, we were in the still in the kilowatt arena. Then we uh, scaled up to the megawatt arena. Today, we are the base unit size is 17.5 uh, megawatts. This is CLISA 300. And we are heavily working on it scaling further up to the triple digit megawatt arena. So what you see here is this kind of very typical classical exponential growth and still far away from the real a giga scale, which is required to get brutal cost down and massive economy of scale. Um, we are very much preparing for this ourselves. So we, we do a lot of digital engineering now to be prepared for uh, larger volumes. We do bigger plant designs already today for 50 megawatts unit sizes. And we ramp up also to be prepared uh, to manufacture in a gigawatt arena. Uh, per year and even further increase that. So we prepare ourselves to serve there. And in our opinion, this is of absolute importance to utilize economy of scale and get the cost down. And we come to that point again in, in, in some of the later slides. I skip this slide here. This is just an overview about um, how the whole system might look like just to save a bit of time. I guess you are familiar with that. Now I would more uh, likely uh, more come to the question what needs to happen that we all come to the real breakthrough. This means um, the uh, operators utilizing the hydrogen that they can uh, economically feasible utilize green hydrogen. What then needs to happen on the supplier side, but also on the research side, it's all interconnected since with increasing volumes, also the research, the, the, the budgets will be uh, released for the research and also this will get more intensified. So we all expect a more kind of exponential growth in this area with increasing business volume. Now, just to give you a very simple, pragmatic um, view, uh, I did the following. What you see here on the ordinate is the power in gigawatt. And on the abscissa, you see the year, starting with the year 2000. And uh, if it would be in an auditorium, I would have asked you, what do you think, what has been built uh, in terms of green electrolysis, H2 electrolysis, not alkaline, green water electrolysis, in the last 20 years? Believe it or not, it's, it's only something around 0 0.25 gigawatts. So something around 250 megawatts, cumulative worldwide. This is where we are today. Uh, so it's all new build. Uh, we did not account for existing one. Yeah? Now, if we go one step further, what does the European Union want? They want six gigawatt installed in 24. We have now 21. This is in three years. And furthermore, European Union targets 40 gigawatt in 2030, which is not so far away anymore in industrial scale. And just here is an indicator, Germany targets five. I think also the Netherlands has a target. I, I don't know at the moment, we might discuss later. So these are the targets. So this is a good thing. The politics have set the targets. However, target setting is not enough. Now, where should all the energy come from? 
for this electrolysis. I just simply made a sketch here, the offshore wind capacity in the European Union. We all know that onshore wind is difficult and limited for many reasons. I don't want to go into that detail. However, offshore wind seems extremely attractive, especially taking into account the Dutch border, the German uh, uh, coast coastline. So there's really great potential with capacity factors round about 0.5, so 50%. This is really high compared to onshore. So what has been installed so far? Peak power, something around 22 gigawatt in the whole European Union. And in average, taking utilization factor of something around 50%, we end up with 10 gigawatts. So this is to today all in put in form of electrons into the grid. And for sure, it makes a lot of sense as long as you have the grid connection to feed it all into the grid for pure efficiency reasons. Now, what is the plan here? This is the EU target 2030. It's, um, uh, I think it's 60 gigawatt. Or if you take the utilization factor here, we end up here. So. We definitely need to answer the question, where, where will the energy come from for this nice electrolysis targets? And again, taking into account that we today have 21 and we want six gigawatt here. And also, if you look, many of the electrolysis companies are stock noted. You can easily look, they make losses today. So uh, we definitely need a very, very strong stimulation in form of uh, input of renewable energy plus also build up of renew, renewable uh, build up of electrolysis capacity to really make it happen. And we need in industry some time for planning. We need some plan for uh, approval, governmental approvals, and so on. You all know about that. And definitely, also as soon as this ramps up, we will spend, I guess, much more also on the R and D side. And uh, also do some smart moves there to get the capex cost down, and then the hen and egg problem will get solved. Uh, I'm looking to time now. Maybe I skip this slide here. Um, there are some further challenges. The one is how to transport, and this had also been covered today. A very very attractive attractive model is to transport via as gas via pipelines. It's uh, extremely cheap. However. In many areas of the world, you have good renewable conditions, however, no demand center. And then you most likely, we will, the world will go the liquid route. Uh, may it be a synthetic fuel line or also ammonia? Um, uh, this could be very, very likely uh, ways to go. So we need figure, to figure out solutions there to get the uh, cheap electricity converted in the regions where, where we have good renewables and then transport the energy. And there are many further challenges. I just listed here some of them. Um, so we need the distribution and storage infrastructures. It looks very good. We published a white paper last year jointly with pipeline operators. It looks extremely good to convert existing natural gas pipelines to hydrogen operation. We need approval processes for all that. Uh, how to convert it? Uh, it? This is definitely also a challenge. We need something to get a trade starting with that. We need certificates of origin. Today, it's not there. We need trading schemes for that. We will need, what I said, incentives for green H2 or climate neutral H2, but we also need to think about further penalizing CO2 uh, emissions. That means CO2 price increase. We for sure need a de stronger demand for green e-fuels and we also should overcome the electrons versus molecule discussion, especially in mobility. We think it makes a lot of sense for the transition period to feed in much more uh, green energy in terms also of green hydrogen into the refinery process. And there is much more. So I would like to stop here, uh, Tom, to keep to my 10 minutes and uh, keep <laughs> enough room for the discussion. <laughs> okay. Yeah, um, thank you, uh, Thomas, uh, for the introduction. So like proposed, I think it's uh, uh, good to now move to Ivo. There is two questions in the chat. The advantage is, Thomas, that you have some time to <laughs> think about the answer. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> with that, um, I like to um, introduce uh, a, a colleague of mine, Ivo uh, Wessels. He is with uh, VDL Energy Systems. He has a background also in equipment uh, from tire company to precision equipment uh, for semiconductor and now heading the relatively new VDL Energy Systems uh, uh, company, uh, part of the VDL group, and uh, Ivo will explain. So Ivo, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Tom. Um, just uh, share my screen. Uh, Tom, can you check whether you can see it? 
uh, yeah, the sh screen is visible. Your audio is a little bit uh, 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 down, let's say. The audio is weak. It's now better. Well, yeah, a little bit better, but. <laughs> okay. Okay. Let's pick it up from here. Um, yeah, thank you. So I continue and I assume I can uh, be uh, understood. Um, yeah, I have a presentation about uh, VDL energy systems. I assume that most of you know uh, who VDL company is, but uh, for who's the, who uh, don't, uh, we are a family owned company within the Netherlands. Uh, one of the 70 companies uh, size, and we are mainly focusing on manufacturing. Uh, we are surfacing uh, different markets, uh, which is a glance uh, shown on this, uh, on this slide. Uh, mobility and uh, technology is, is mainly driving us. And if we go back to uh, with that technology, what we are doing is we are trying to, to, to use the gains uh, technology from the semiconductor market, mechatronics, for instance, into, into other uh, areas of the, and also other markets. And also what we are doing is um, the gain technology in e-mobility because we do have already 20 years of experience in heavy duty uh, electrical drivetrains. And those combinations together with our experience in the, in the automotive sector because we are optimizing uh, uh, car manufacturing companies by uh, creating uh, robotization uh, for, uh, for big companies. And uh, with those three uh, uh, knowledge areas, we are combining into the energy sector because uh, by the end of 2018, we, have, uh, we took over one of the uh, Siemens companies uh, located in the Netherlands. Uh, and with that company, we took a step into the domain of energy. We have a strong history uh, coming back from, uh, from the company of Stork, going to Siemens and now uh, into uh, VDL. And we are creating a new future for that company by building new facility and also by uh, we're picking up a new strategy into, into the renewables. Um, basically shown here that coming from the traditional energy, uh, which uh, also highlighted already by, uh, by Thomas Thiemann, because we are producing four Siemens uh, gas turbines and also gas compressor systems, but we are focusing more and more on the energy transition uh, by reusing knowledge Within, uh, within our group towards products uh, that will give the contribution in the energy transition. Focusing on that, what we have developed is uh, based on modularity uh, coming from small sizes, uh, 50 kilowatts up to 500, up to the one megawatt uh, system we are developing energy storage electrical power units, also fuel cell and hydrogen power units. And uh, what we are doing also is uh, starting up an electrolyzer uh, uh, development project together with a group of companies within the domain. And we, bring in, we are bringing our knowledge gained in the, in the previous mentioned markets. Um, what we are doing with those uh, products, and that is, uh, this is a picture of our new facility, is that we are building a decentral energy storage system. And that is, uh, uh, we have heard uh, this afternoon, uh, looking at concrete projects. Uh, this is our concrete project. We are building a demo site where we are using uh, the solar uh, and wind power to store them locally and store them locally into battery systems, creating uh, hydrogen with our electrolyzer and bringing the round trip complete by uh, bringing back by the fuel cell generator and back to electricity when there is no sun or there is no wind. And 
this demo field is uh, meant to serve uh, future developments. So what we are doing, for instance, is uh, creating a situation that uh, once we have also the, for instance, the ammonia application, that we can easily put them in the in the demo field uh, and do the tests, do the developments, and uh, to create an environment to uh, develop future uh, future uh, uh, products. This is planned to be built uh, next year. The facility is now in the end phase. So this year we will use this new facility, but the demo field will be uh, built immediately afterwards and will become live in 2022. Okay, basically this is my, uh, uh, because I needed to, to stay also with the 10 minutes <laughs> to create. <laughs> So well, I will give it uh, back to you, Tom. Thank you. That worked. <laughs> so, yeah. So thank you, uh, Ivo, for that um, <clears throat> introduction. Um, I propose we, uh, yeah, we can switch on cameras if we like, um, <clears throat> and uh, we can uh, look at the chat. Um, and I'd like to start with some uh, questions that were posed during the presentation of uh, Thomas. The first one was uh, for PEM electrolyzers. I assume you have to rely on iridium. How do you foresee challenges in respect to upscaling there? It's also a rare metal. Right? Yeah, yeah, very good question. Um, and I expect, to be honest, I expected the question. So we all okay. know uh, iridium is extremely rare. Worldwide production is something around five to seven tons. Um, we are aware of this uh, challenge. And our answer to that is we do extremely intensive research jointly with research partners to find very smart ways um, to bring the iridium in the form of special coating process um, onto the membranes and very significantly reducing the iridium content. So we are really uh, talking about a pretty high scaling down factor of the iridium amount. This is currently under heavy R&D, so this is one, one part of the answer. So we are extremely aware of this challenge and we are working on that. Mm -hmm. That's also, by the, by the way, what I said, why we need the research institutes and you will see uh, maybe even new paths and a lot of energy going into certain research energy going into certain direction. And the second part is also um, the recycling topic. So definitely once you have initiated this, you will run into a recycling pattern also and take it out again of the used electrolysis stacks. As we today see, for example, for the catalysts in the car industry, yeah, which is a real big business and it goes in, in cycles. So good question and this is our approach. Thank you for the answer. Uh, Michiel, uh, yeah, you can, uh, is, is this okay? Yes, yeah, sure, thanks, okay. thanks Thomas. Yeah. Yeah, is there any follow up uh, based on the on the response? <clears throat> no, no. Okay. <laughs> I have to get used to this because for now I think it's a, the, it's a good approach. We are also looking into uh, other types than, than iridium. Okay. Yeah. But it's, it's very difficult, I know. Okay. All right. Uh, second question was from uh, Marco Frank Sessel uh, to everyone. But, uh, <laughs> How do you see the intermittency uh, solution? Store power upstream of electrolyzer, install extra electrolyzer capacity and store hydrogen. And it was also to Thomas, I think. <clears throat> uh, yeah, for sure. I can only speak now for the PEM electrolyzers we know very well. Yeah. So first of all, the one is a technical part of the, of the answer. Um, the, our electrolyzers are proven to be having extreme cycle uh, capabilities. So it's absolutely no problem. And uh, we demonstrated that to have ramp rates of 10% per second in power. So we could go in uh, 10 seconds to 100% load and in 10 seconds down, and we ran up and down and tried. So, so this works with the PEM electrolyzers. This is, by the way, one of the nice uh, uh, positive things. Uh, the second part is the commercial. The second part of the answer is the commercial part. And there I must really say, um, as long as the capex is not really extremely down, you need to utilize this um, still pretty high value hardware. So um, to operate, for example, directly with the solar park, where you where is a standstill overnight and you have only the noon peak, 
you even would not design for the peak power in noon time. So you would design for lower. Um, then it gets really tricky. So, so you should do as long as we are in the current state of today, and this is valid for the today's price or cost levels of all electro electrolyzers, it's still important to have a good utilization. So to bring the electrolyzers, electrolyzers to the sunny regions, to combine them with offshore wind, this makes a lot of sense. And as soon as CapEx goes down with economy of scale, this will get less important. And you can imagine as an asymptotic value in the final end, it doesn't matter anymore. And I'm convinced uh, sooner or later in the next many years, the world will come to such a state. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, okay. <laughs> Um, there was an addition to this uh, question by Marco, and it was a question to how a gigawatt electrolyzer will, will deal with this a gigawatt electrolyzer plant, that is. Is, is there additional co considerations for that, or is that also answered here? Uh, maybe I also can comment on that. If you mean one gigawatt in operation, yeah. um, so not in production, maybe. Uh, Maybe Johan yeah. can 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 uh, illustrate. Them, uh, yeah. So, so I just asked myself, indeed. Eh, so if you have a really a huge plant like the, um, like this, uh, do you still have these uh, really short uh, ramp up and down uh, times, or is it then actually much lo much longer? Can you can you explain that a bit? Yeah. It, uh, we don't expect it to be longer as long as we stick to the stack te technology we apply today. So, uh -huh. so this is stack specific. And as you know, electrolyzers are area um, scaling um, uh, technologies. So um, as long as we rely on this base technology of the stacks and just multiply then the stacks, for sure we want to get them cheaper and all that, but the basic uh, physical features will not change. So right. even that will be possible as long as you stick to this technology. And again, I speak here only for our own experience with the PAM technology. For alkaline, this might yeah. look different. I cannot speak for that. OK, thank you. Thank you. There is a question for Ivo. Uh, there was another question, uh, I think, for, for Thomas. But let's go to the question for Ivo. Will VDL develop electrolyzer technology from scratch? And what technology will be focused on? Yeah. Um, what we are trying to do is, uh, although it seems pretty straightforward that uh, within the application we are looking for, PAM is the, is the most uh, interesting uh, uh, technology, but we are doing an effort to see whether we can have an alkaline uh, stack in, the, in, the, in, the, in this application we are looking for. And what we are looking for is uh, to gain more speed uh, by a different uh, different setup of the of, uh, of a stack, and uh, to give to give an answer. Uh, yes, we are looking for uh, also to have a uh, stack development uh, together with a uh, group of uh, specialists, and uh, we are partnering in a project. Okay. Thank you. 